You may have been hearing a lot about the coronavirus from a, a wide variety of sources, but here I'm going to provide a scientific investigation related to the coronavirus. Well, where do you get information? You know, it's constantly changing the situation, as at least as of right now. Uh, this is a great link to a website that provides you a lot of scientific articles that may be a little detailed in the reading, uh, but definitely worthwhile and are staying up to date. Uh, so a great information center on this novel coronavirus as the situation develops. Now, key terms that are used. So you'll hear a lot of terms used here or hear about them in the news. Epidemic, pandemic, and endemic. You might think they're all interchangeable when in fact they're not. The, the epidemic, for example, refers to an increase often sudden in the number of cases of a disease beyond what is normally expected. So how does that visually look? Well, an epidemic would be like a region here showing a lot of signs of disease. Ebola went through an epidemic. Pandemic is a worldwide spread of disease, and that's kind of depicted here where you see it showing up all over the regions. Yes, localized in certain areas, but overall spread over the world. And an endemic refers to constant presence or prevalence of a disease. So here you can see it's not necessarily a large cluster, but it's just kind of showing up all over. Uh, so this is kind of a nice visual representation of how these three terms differ. In addition, we have uh, pathogenicity, virulence, and mutation. So patho pathogenicity and virulence, uh, comparing those two, this offers a good comparison. Looking at the ability for organism to cause disease, uh, and virulence is the relative capacity of a pathogen to overcome body defenses. So this is kind of how virulent is a disease. That means how likely is it to infect you and cause a problem. And the mutation is simply a change in DNA sequence, which leads to a change in proteins. So it brings us to what's a virus. I mean, here about the coronavirus. Well, do we even know what a virus is? Well, a virus is an uh, infective agent, typically consists of a nucleic acid molecule in a protein coat. They're very small, cannot be seen with a traditional light microscope, and they multiply within a living host. So we see here the viruses bind the living host, cause the host to mass multiply itself, and then uh, release many more particles. That same viral DNA is being injected into a cell and kind of overrides the cell's natural machinery. Now we say the term virus, this is what they all generally consist of, but they can have very different shapes here, as we can see here. Um, so viruses is a category, but within that there's many subcategories. So why are viruses hard to control? Well, the answer is they're continually changing, they're continually mutating. Uh, the coronavirus have frequent mutations and recombination events. They're constantly going through changes in the hopes that they'll become better fit for the environment for the virus, and we hope to try to create um, conditions that will reduce their fitness. Previous studies have shown that um, SARS has mutated over the 2002-2004 uh, epidemic to better bind to cellular receptors. This just shows here is an example of a virus going through a mutation that would cause it to be better fit in the environment. Here would be less fit for the environment. You can see the change in genes over time. And at letter C would be the most fit. A would be one of the least fits here. But again, they're constantly changing, which makes them difficult to pinpoint and control. And again, at the bottom of all these slides where I've used them, I've tried to provide uh, examples here of the links of sources that I've used, as well as in the description there's information as well. So natural human fear viruses, well it's based on history. The Spanish flu uh, caused by the H1N1 influenza virus affected 500 million people, almost a third of the world population, and killed 25 to 50 million people. Uh, so again, viruses, we hear that term, uh, and naturally there's a fear because of what history has um, uh, shown us. So let's just take the flu for an example here. Uh, looking at the CDC estimates that between 9 million and 45 million illnesses occurred within the flu, 140 to 810 hospitalizations, and 12,000 to 61,000 deaths since 2010. So this is looking back at the last couple of years, it varies year to year. We could see a lot more illnesses, less hospitalizations, and luckily less deaths. Uh, the uh, case fatality rate is 0.05%. That means that's the percentage of people that do die uh, from the influenza flu. And the RO value, which we'll talk about later, is 1.3. So just remember these numbers. We'll see how they compare. But this is just for regular influenza, common cold, that typically spreads uh, in the wintertime every year. Now let's take a better look at the coronavirus. So getting to coronavirus, well, there's coronaviruses, yes. And I put the S here with a question mark because it's not just one type of virus. It's named for a family of viruses. Uh, MERS, SARS, and now uh, coronavirus all fall into this same category. 
All three of these originate in bats, which is kind of interesting. They all have generally similar shapes, uh, so they're all in the coronavirus category. Now the coronavirus itself, it's kind of a zoomed in look, it's named for the crown-like spikes on the surface and a group of viruses that cause a significant percentage of all common colds in human adults and children around the world. So again, this is a classification of coronaviruses. Um, this is a general family and they are known to cause diseases in humans. I provide with some of these specific names here and as well as links at the bottom of the page. Now what is known about the coronavirus at least uh, currently? Well, looking at the current, it um, originated in Wuhan, China. Human-to-human -human transmission is typically via droplets or direct contact, and the incubation period can be as long as 24 days, with the median incubation being about 6.4 days, ranging from 2.1 to 11.1 days in the 2.5 is to 70 to 97.5 percentile. What does that mean? Well, if we take these stats here, we're looking at the vast majority of cases here. This area represented here and here would be that 2.1 to 11.1 .1 days. So 24 days seems to be kind of the longest uh, chance, and that's based on the sources provided here at the bottom. Uh, but 2.1 11.1 days typical incubation period being as long as, in at least one case, 24 days. Now epidemiology, so what we're looking at here is a coronavirus is highly uh, contagious with within about two hours survival time within the air. Uh, all age groups are susceptible to the virus, the very young to the very old. Elderly patients with um, two chronic conditions at the same time are more likely to experience severe illness. This is just common that if an immune system is already compromised or already battled in one disease and it gets infected with another, um, it is more likely to cause death or more serious effects uh, because of the multiplication here. And we can see just another example here. It's not just for coronavirus, looking at arthritis and heart disease, diabetes, and being obese. Now, detailed replication of the coronavirus. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but you can see here's a very detailed sequence of steps just to give you the idea of the complexities of a virus and how they have to bind to cells, transfer their own DNA, uh, kind of invade the cell's natural machinery, cause that cell to mass multiply the virus particles, and then export those uh, particles to the outside of the cells so they can go through and infect other cells. So again, pretty complex process. This is why viruses can be difficult to control. It's not just as easy as killing them. There's really nothing to kill simply because you have that um, protein coat and DNA. They're not living, breathing, necessarily, particles. Now, reproduction number. This is the RO factor here. Looking at a little comparison uh, denied by r naught, and it refers to viral trans transmissibility. So how many people is one person likely to infect? The epidemiology definition of RO is the average number of people who will catch a disease from one contagious person. This applies to a population. So if you have an R0 of 2 uh, and you have a patient 0, they will infect 2 people. Each of them can then go for and infect about 2 people. SARS has an R0 of 4, and you can see how this one down here can quickly multiply um, in a much greater um, rate. So this is why we take those R0 values into consideration. Now, potential spread or decline of disease, what does these are not refer to? Well, if it's less than one, each existing infectious causes causes less than one new infection, if it's less than one. In this case, if we just think about this logically, the disease will decline and eventually be uh, non-existent. If R uh, not equals one, the disease will stay alive, but there won't be an, an epidemic, meaning one person will usually pass it to one person. Where diseases that get a little bit of concern here is how much greater is it than one? because this will cause the disease to grow exponentially, potentially, and cause an epidemic or even a pandemic. Again, the higher the number here, the more people uh, that can spread. You can see measles here is 11 to 18. It means one infectious person will likely infect 11 to 18 people. Now, the R value for the coronavirus here, from what's currently known, the calculated R naught value of coronavirus is significantly greater than one. But this isn't to be concerned. The preliminary r naught estimate is between 1.4 and 2.5 was presented at the World Health Organization statement uh, in the information here on January 23rd, year 2020, information here at the bottom. The case fatality rate is about 3%. That means of all those infected, 3% typically um, result in the fatality, and the r naught value of 1.4 to 2.5. So this is all great numbers, but how does this compare to other diseases? So if we look here at the kind of the comparison, 
uh, to diseases over on, on, the, on this side here, we see the case of fatality rate. So this is in percentage. So that coronavirus, 3% will die. We'll compare to SARS, 10%. MERS, 40%. Uh, avian flu, 40%. You can see some really high values here. We also see some lower values as well. In the r naught values, again, for corona, 1.4, potentially as high as 5.5. Uh, you could see uh, mirrors here at uh, less than 1. Avian flu, less than 1. Um, so these have a very high fatality rate, but very low to transmit. Um, so again, corona, not, they say, the highest to be transmitted, and not the highest uh, case fatality rate, um, even though it's being talked about in the news, like it's spreading like crazy and killing everyone. I'll look at the data here and put it a little bit in perspective. Uh, HIV, if untreated, 80% um, here without therapy. Um, so again, that case fatality rate, much, much higher. So again, something to consider here, or at least put it in perspective. So when we're looking at a higher pathogenicity trends, it uh, tends to have lower transmissibility. So if we look at the influenza virus, the pandemic of H1N1 virus caused relatively mild disease and became endemic in the population. It bound to receptors in the upper respiratory tract. Compared to H7N9 virus, it had a tally rate of actually 40%, very high, and you can go back and take a look at this, and has so far resulted in only a few small clusters of human-to-human -human transmission in the specifically bound receptors in the lower respiratory tract. Another example is measles virus and the rhinovirus have strong transmissibility, but low mortality rate. Um, so again, kind of get this trade-off of very high uh, mortality rate, but very low to be transmitted. So it's kind of interesting to see this trend occur. Again, re um, resource there at the bottom. So pathogenicity and transmissibility of the coronavirus currently seems to have relatively low pathogen pathogenicity and a moderate transmissibility. So here's a comparison here of some other viruses here. You can pause the slide and take a look at that. Also welcome and encouraged to look at some of the resources here that I pulled this information from. Again, this just tries to put it in perspective. So just kind of that reality check here. Um, the CDC, Center for Disease Controls, and World Health Organization are working on addressing the issue and providing updates. Your goal is to inform yourself but be cautious of new sources. Getting uh, resources from scientific papers may not be the easiest. It gets away from opinions and catchy headlines. Kind of these white papers are great to get some data and some information rather than just reading a flashy headline and jumping to a conclusion. And also keep the situation in perspective. I have the example here. If someone looks here and sees the number six and someone over here sees the number nine, put it in perspective. H1N1 had a very similar progression and people are naturally afraid of something that has the potential to cause death, uh, which viruses do. But again, how severe is this? You know, what precautions are being taken? What precautions can you take? Uh, this isn't something that's a very, very high mortality rate percentage-wise. Uh, so working together, uh, as long as transmission of the virus from one person to another could be substantially and consistently interrupted, if we could get through means of isolating people and get that R value, R not value less than one, it's entirely possible this outbreak could be controlled or even eradicated going forward. However, this requires a joint efforts of the entire society. Just as an example, polio uh, was very high. We could see how those numbers crashed uh, through a cooperative effort, and this has to be a worldwide cooperative effort. Uh, lastly, the importance is education. So educating the communities and strengthening public confidence will thus be important, and that's hopefully why you're watching this video here. Just provide yourself with some education, provide yourself with some resources, so you can approach this uh, from more of a scientific and not a headline uh, format, so you can be an informed person and inform others uh, with quality information.